Uh, tonight's reading is uh, John 3, 16 through 21. But God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned, already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for the fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives in the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what is what he has done has been done through God. Amen. So we're continuing on with our Christmas series here, and uh, I've entitled uh, this evening's message, Seeing God's Love at Christmas. And uh, I thought this was a great passage, uh, not only to encapsulate that, but um, for somebody who hasn't preached in a while, uh, where better to go than John 3.16, right? So, uh, a very familiar verse, I'm sure, to, to many of us. When we come to understand the subject of God's love at Christmas, we not only get to the core of what Christmas is all about, we also uncover the heart of what it means to know God, to follow Him, and to embrace uh, the life that He has called us to. So, uh, this evening, as we unpack these verses here, we're going to take a look at it in three different sections. First, uh, God's eternal purpose our biggest problem, and God's redemptive plan. Our, God's eternal purpose, our biggest problem, and God's redemptive plan. Let's just uh, pause here and just ask the Lord to be speaking to us as we do. Uh, Father, this is your word, and we are your people, and yet we are in the presence of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we ask that you would take each one of these elements and do what you want to do. Uh, with us. Use this broken vessel as you would, Lord, to show that the power comes from you and not from any individual, Lord. Um, it is the truth of your word, and I pray that um, nothing would be in the way of the clear and direct proclamation of what you want to say to each and every heart that's here. Uh, we pray these things all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God's eternal purpose, and uh, this is... Uh, really wrapped up in the opening statement of the verse that you just heard uh, Tiger read. Um, God's eternal purpose is a heart of love. And this comes very clearly to us in verse 16. For God so loved the world. In one rather simple uh, five-word declaration, God makes clear his heart. It's not complicated. It's not really hard to figure out. Within this simple statement, we learn the answer to the most profound questions of the universe. Why am I here? Does my life have meaning? Is there a God? If there is, what does he think of me? In one simple statement, the most profound answers are given. There is a God. No, you're not him. He loves you. He loves everyone. His very nature is creative, dynamic, tender, furious love. And here we're brought inside the complexity of this greatest attribute of God. God's eternal purpose is his MO, his job description, how he operates, who he is at the core of his being. And unfortunately, we've simplified it by applying a one word solution to it and that one word solution has inadvertently clouded its true meaning to us it's simply love and in reality it's a powerful word and yet i could have a conversation with you after this service we could just be fellowshipping together and i could have a conversation with you and you wouldn't blink, I promise, you would not blink if in that conversation I told you how much I love my coworkers, how much I love 
my good friend, how much I love mocha chip ice cream, and how much I love my wife. I could work all those in in a way that you would not even bat an eye. To the Greek mindset and to the Hebrew mindset, in the minds and hearts of most of the cultures uh, where our scriptures were born, love is way too wide-ranging and complex to fit under just one umbrella. In the New Testament, the language our Bibles was written in, in Greek, uh, the Greek has no less than four distinct words that combine uh, into the word love. Perhaps you've heard these before. Uh, storge love, familial love. Uh, phileo, uh, love, friend, brotherly love. Eros, physical love, sexual desire. If this is all we knew about love and you just had to kind of pick here, I, I bet most people would probably say, you know what, what John 3.16 is saying is, for God so storge the world. You can't really add a D to something like you can in English and make it do that, but you understand what I'm saying. Most people would say, that's, yeah, that's, that's probably what it is. It's probably God storgated the world because how many times does he call himself our father in Scripture, right? So it must be storge. For God so familiarly loved us that he gave his son. But we'd be wrong. The Holy Spirit instead moves John to use a different word as he's writing out this third chapter of John by actually saying, for God so agape the world. Agape. What is this? A new Greek term for love. It's not love born out of physical attraction like eros. It's not a love born out of obligation like our family relations. Agape is unconditional, sacrificial love. It doesn't benefit me. It's self-giving. It's, self it's not self-serving. It's self-giving. It's uh, self-demoting, if anything, for the blessing and, and honoring of the other. It's unconditional. And it's quite clear that agape is unlike all other loves as we read the next words. For God so loved the world that he gave. That's what helps us unpack that. It's not just God so loved the world and on and on and on. Herein lies the true heart of Christmas. God's self-giving love that he would even give his son. It's not for God so loved the world that he commanded. It's not for God so loved the world that he convicted. It's God so loved the world that he gave. And it was in that self-giving that God showed his true heart, his true purpose. As I was thinking about this and wrestling with this, I spit out a couple of sentences here that I did not memorize, so I'm just going to read them to you here because it, it's kind of wrapped up in a little bit in the, the opening song about uh, Bethlehem, where you're sleeping. But as I was thinking about this idea of what must it have been like for God to give part of himself, that part of himself that was his son, however that works in the Trinity, this is where I landed. There's a majestic, undefinable mystery in the love between a parent and a child. Perhaps if we truly understand that, we would have eyes to see more of the spiritual forces of darkness that are working overtime to shatter the natural God-inspired love that's supposed to exist between an expectant mother and her not-yet-born child, both of whom are being supported and protected by a father-slash-husband whose heart is also filled with inexpressible love. We see all of these taking place in the story of the coming of our Savior. We see the self-sacrificial love of agape at the heart of Christmas. And yet, it's a complicated story because we have mankind's big problem. And his big problem is that we have a love-averse heart. Anything averse is to be disinclined or repelled or reluctant to give yourself to it. And that certainly defines mankind. While John 3.16 is widely considered the most famous verse in all the Bible, and for good reason, the words of Jesus actually take a dark turn in the subsequent verses, as you heard. But the world would do well to listen to those verses as well. As if underscoring the agape of God, John 3.17 begins, 
For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he's not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Why, oh why, do we stop at 16? There is such power in these words. This is Jesus speaking these words. Can you hear his voice saying, wait, people, don't misunderstand why I've come. I have not come to bring condemnation. I came to bring salvation. Realigning your life's compass. That's actually a, the, a good d- biblical definition for belief, as a matter of fact. We think of belief as all taking place up here. That is not in any way true of the Greek mindset at all. Okay, that belief could somehow just be something that takes place between the ears. Realigning our life's compass brings this salvation. Unbelief or a refusal to realign our life compass is the only thing that brings condemnation. And some are going to say, aha, he finally did it. I was waiting for him to do this. Where's the condemnation? I come to church to feel condemned. It's got to be in here somewhere, right? Where's, where am I going to be made to feel bad about myself? Wait a sec. If you keep reading, it's not God's condemnation that leads to our demise. It's completely self-sabotage. What do I mean? Well, look at the opening words of verse 19. They're quite compelling. This is the verdict. Okay, just stop right there. If you're reading the words in Scripture, and they're in red, and it's Jesus speaking, and Jesus is Emmanuel, God in the flesh, and he starts a sentence with, this is the verdict, we should all sit up a little straighter, right? We should all tune in just a little bit more. This is the verdict? Whoa! We're going to hear the verdict here. Here it is. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness. Instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. God is telling you and he's telling me, here's the final truth that you need to grasp. The God of love is the God of light and he's the God of purity and he's the God of honesty and he's the God of holiness. But guess what? You and I willfully choose darkness, and we choose hiding, and we choose impurity, and we choose living in dishonesty, and we choose uh, to put ourselves before others, and we choose the path of unholiness. And when we choose to live that way, we not only avoid the light, but as it says in verse uh, uh, verse 20, everyone who does evil hates the light. My, uh, my sister out in California, uh, when they first moved out to California, I went out and, and, and uh, lived with them for a little while as they were getting s- settled in. And uh, they had a church that they went to, and it was a super old church. And uh, the coolest thing to me as a 19-year-old kid was the kitchen of this church. It was amazing. I loved this kitchen. It was so cool. You walk into the kitchen, and you throw the lights on, and all the cockroaches, you can just catch them, a, a quick glimpse, glimpse of them, really quick. Uh, just before they take off to their appointed hiding spot. It was the coolest thing. (laughs) They didn't like it as much as I did, but every single time. And then you go, you leave, you wait, you wait a little while, and you you know, somebody else comes along, and I remember this, you know, this kid comes along and says, hey, you want to see something cool? Yeah, hey, come, come with me. We go down to the kitchen, throw the lights on, and all they go, off they go. Why? The light. It wasn't my voice. It wasn't the, the trembling of the ground. It wasn't, I wasn't spraying anything in the room. It was simply the light that was enough to send them running. The one speaking in John chapter 3, this same Jesus was, would go on to say later that it's not just a matter of Everyone who does evil hates the light, because guess what? The feeling is mutual. The same Jesus would go on to say later in the Gospel of John, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. There's a mutual hatred. We wanted to avoid the light, and those with the light we wanted to avoid as well. 
But when we stand in the light, we become hated by the world. Jesus goes on to tell us why, and it comes down to one ugly word. Ugly word. Probably one of the ugliest, I'd put it in easily the top five, if not the top three ugliest words in the Bible to me. Jesus goes on to tell us why. Why this uh, difficult relationship. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light. Why? For fear that his deeds will be exposed. Anybody enjoy that word? I'm curious. Anybody enjoy that thought or that concept? I mean, we literally have a law against public exposure, right? Exposure is so bad, we have to tell people it's against the law. We'll throw you in jail. When we're raising up children, we're telling them these things are not the things that you say out in public. Don't even say them at home. These are not words that we want to expose. Jesus is saying, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for this one simple fear. If I go into the light, they're going to see who I am and what I've done. And we think... All right, well, let's move on. Well, wait a sec. Don't move on too quickly. God holds a pure and holy love for the world. We harbor love for the shadows. Driven by what? Driven by a fear of exposure. A fear of the light. It never ceases to amaze me that in this very building, twice a week, right downstairs, there's a group of people that don't even have time for hiding in the shadows. It's because of hiding in the shadows that they came to the end of their rope and almost, in some cases, the end of their life. And so they come together in a 12-step group to say, listen, here's my junk. No song and dance. No plastic smile. No, I'm fine, you're fine, everybody's fine. That's what almost killed me. Isn't it curious how no little child ever was put to bed at night and cried, Mommy, Mommy, it's too light in here. <laughs> Mommy, I'm afraid of the light. Recall the words of Jesus in Matthew 18. I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you're never going to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's one of the interesting things about working with kids. I, I say this with fear and trepidation in case people are watching this on video that might think, yikes, was it my child? Uh, kids tell you everything. Kids, as a matter of fact, sometimes you have to go, nee, don't share that here. You know? I'm sorry, daddy's sleeping on the couch, but mm, you, know, you know, it's just out there. No filters, no nothing. They're just gonna share it, right? Why? Why hide it? It's life. They haven't learned yet. Mask it. Cover it. Put a story on it. Put a spin on it. Make yourself look good. Unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. You need to stop running from the light. Third, finally, the redemptive plan. What is God's redemptive plan? Love in the light. It's a curious interplay going on in Jesus' words here in John chapter 3. It's the back and forth between love and light, hate and darkness. God so loved, there's the light, has come into the world. We hated the light, we preferred the darkness. Light and love, hate and darkness. The interplay echoes back to the opening chapters of John's Gospel as he paints the backdrop for God's redemptive plan to unfold. Speaking of Jesus, the word of God made flesh, John writes these words, the very beginning of his gospel. In him was life, and that life was the light. The light of men. But the darkness has not understood it. Interesting phrase. Because guess what? 2,000 years later, 
is just as true. Just as true. By the way, this is not some New Testament phenomenon unfolding here about light and love being wrapped up in the work of Jesus. Half a millennia earlier, the prophet Isaiah would write these words, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. God's saying, I'm going to do a work. And when I do that work, it's going to be like somebody throwing the lights on. Don't be one of those people who runs. God's redemptive plan for his children to live in the love and to live in his light. Risking exposure, maybe even embracing it, for the sake of knowing and being known. Listen to the last part of John chapter 3 that we were reading earlier. John chapter 3, verse 21. Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. See, there's two goals that get met when you come into the light of God's love. There's an earthly goal, there's a heavenly goal. The earthly goal of coming into the light of God's love is that others are going to see that God is powerfully at work. so that it may be plainly seen that what he has done has been done through God. They're going to see what God is doing in you. Why? So that he'll get the glory. So that he'll be praised. Want to bring God the highest glory? Step out of the shadows, embrace his light, and watch what happens. That's the earthly goal. What's the heavenly goal? The heavenly goal of God's redemptive plan, walking in the light, is that God's saving work is going to continue to grow, and it's going to continue to spread, and it's going to continue to heal, and it's ultimately going to reap eternal rewards. Listen to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Though you haven't seen him, you love him. And though you don't see him now, you believe in him, and you're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The goal of your faith, the goal of it all, the goal of the entire redemptive plan of God, salvation. Working this message backwards, we can think of it this way. God has a purpose for humanity, if we open our eyes uh, to the thread that holds it all together, the thread of love for which God made you and made me, and yet there is a problem. We have love-averse hearts. We've created quite elaborate lives here in the darkness. But for some people, if they're honest, they're tired of hiding in the shadows. And this message rings in their hearts. Stepping back further, we see God's eternal plan projected across the universe from a heart of love. As a matter of fact, it goes on to say in the, uh, in the epistle of John that God is love. See, God made you and me for connection in the light, first with him, then with one another. It's about rejecting the lie that God's demeanor is about standards and expectations that he's chronically disappointed that we don't meet them. That is not the heart of God. He loves you. He loves you not because he wants something from you. That's Eros. He loves you not because he made you and therefore he has to. That's Storge. He loves you not because he's in need of companionship. That's Phileo. So I was trying to think, what's, what's the best way to try to encapsulate this idea of how do we understand the breadth of God's love? How do, can we wrap our human minds around it? And, and I just kind of went back over my life, and I went back over uh, the lives of those that are close to me, and I thought, yeah, it's little pieces of each one of these things, but not one encapsulates it. It's like God's love is a combination and an infinitely magnified version of all the pieces of love that we've maybe experienced here on earth. 
If we could take all the collective love experiences that we've had and bring them together and somehow combine them and then infinitely magnify them, right? We only feel them one at a time, right? That girl in fourth grade that I had a crush on. What was that weird feeling inside? Ugh, what is that? All those little experiences and circumstances. And then somehow if we could mash them together and then magnify them exponentially, that's where God is. See, we get them in this little clock time experience of life. God is the essence of it all. So imagine with me, imagine a mother's love for her newborn. And combine that with the heart of a man who's just been told yes to a date with his deepest crush. Not separate. Try to imagine adding them together, multiplying them together. Imagine adding to that now the inexplicable love of a daughter for her dad, knowing full well who Superman is, but yet somehow thinks her dad is even greater. Imagine the heart of a soldier who's been wounded in battle and been picked up and slung over the shoulder of his friend. Imagine the love pouring out of the heart of a widower who just lost his two dogs being given a puppy by his daughter. Don't watch the video on YouTube, it's brutal. Maybe add to that the love of new parents finally greeting their adopted children that they've been waiting three years to bring home and greeting them at the airport for the first time and bring them all together and mash them all together and multiply them all together and then infinitely magnify them. It's all of these on a scale of infinity in the heart of a God who would walk away from it all to be laid down in a manger and in a tomb all for love. Let's pray. Father, we just uh, ask that during this time you would help us to just hit the pause button and reflect on your heart of love for us. Father, show us what it means when you say that you so loved this world that you gave. Lord, show us what it means when your scripture says, oh, the, the, the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of the love of God in Christ Jesus. Father, we can't even imagine. We can't wrap our minds around a love like that. But yet it's your message to us this Christmas time that for you so loved this world that you gave. And for anybody that's hearing this message and they have willfully chosen to run and to hide. I pray that this would be their Christmas to embrace love. The love of a father who gave it all on behalf of us. Father, help us to rest in that love and give us, give us a grand, grand picture that as close to it as we think we might come, your love is always greater. It's always just impossible to even sum up that you agape us so much that while we were yet sinners, you would give your own son for us. Father, I wouldn't give my children for people I liked. What kind of love? What kind of love is this that you have for us? Help us to embrace the love poured out for each one of us in Emmanuel, the God who is with us. His name we pray.